The rain was never just rain in Eldritch. It brought whispers, shadows that moved against the will of light, and tales that curled the spines of the most seasoned locals. I'd heard the stories, dismissed them as lore, until that night. I had returned to Eldridge to settle my late uncle's estate, a craggy old house perched on the outskirts of town, where the forest was too thick and the night too complete. As I drove up the gravel path, my headlights caught the flash of a figure darting into the woods. I chalked it up to the nerves of being back in a place that had haunted my childhood with eerie sounds and fleeting shadows. The house loomed like a relic, windows dark, the porch light flickering as if struggling against the darkness. I hesitated at the door, the key cold in my hand, the rustling of the trees like hushed voices urging me back. But I pushed forward, turning the key with a definitive click. Inside, the air was stale, thick with dust and the faint, musty odor of decay. I fumbled for the switch, and the lights flickered to life, casting long, sinister shadows. As I ventured deeper, the house groaned under its own weight, each step a chorus of creaks and moans. The first night was restless. The storm outside mirrored my unease, rain tapping against the window like insistent fingers beckoning me. I lay in bed, the blanket pulled to my chin, listening to the house settling, or so I told myself. Then, a thump from the attic shattered the rhythm of the rain. I told myself it was just the house. Just the wind. But another thump followed, deliberate, too forceful to ignore. Heart pounding, I rose from the bed and grabbed the flashlight from the nightstand. The beam of light seemed feeble against the thick darkness as I made my way to the attic stairs. Each step creaked ominously, the sound swallowed by the howling wind outside. At the top of the stairs, the attic door was ajar. That wasn't right. I had checked all the doors earlier. Hesitating only a moment, I pushed it open. The room was cluttered with boxes, old furniture draped in white sheets, giving the impression of ghosts lurking in the corners. The flashlight flickered, and for a moment, everything went dark. A chill ran down my spine, the darkness pressing in. When the light sputtered back, I thought I saw a figure among the sheets, a darker patch of shadow that seemed to pulse with malevolent intent. I backed away, the floorboards groaning in protest, when a cold breath whispered in my ear, you shouldn't have come back. I spun around, the flashlight swinging wildly, but there was nothing, only the relics of the past and the pounding of my heart. I stumbled back to the bedroom, locked the door, and didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The following days were a blur of cleaning and sorting through my uncle's possessions. But as the rain continued, so did the odd occurrences. Items moved on their own, disappearing only to reappear in impossible places. Whispers filled the hallways, spilling out from the walls, the words indiscernible but the tone pleading. One evening, as twilight bled into night, I found an old photograph album in the library. It was filled with pictures of the town, the house, and people whose eyes followed you across the room. As I flipped through, a photo fell out. It was an image of a group, dated back over 50 years ago, but there in the back, almost hidden behind the others, was a figure with striking resemblance to the shadow I'd seen in the attic. I researched the name scrawled on the back of the photo, discovering tales of a forgotten tragedy, a family lost to a fire that no one in town spoke of. The pieces began to click into place, a narrative of grief and unrest tied to the land, to the house. That night, the storm intensified, the wind howling like the cries of the lost. Unable to sleep, I wandered down to the living room, the air thick with the scent of wet earth and something faintly burnt. The fireplace, long and used, drew me closer. Inside, among the ashes, was an unburnt piece of paper. 
It was a letter, the handwriting shaky, the words smeared by water but still legible, speaking of regret and warnings unheeded. As I read, the temperature dropped, breath visible in the air. The whispering started again, louder this time, a cacophony of voices that filled the room. Leave, they said, over and over, until the word was a mantra, pushing against my skull. I dropped the letter, backing away as the fireplace erupted in spontaneous flame. The fire spread rapidly, the heat intense, the light blinding. In the flames, figures danced apparitions of those from the photo, their features contorted in anguish. Help us, they pleaded, reaching out from the fire. I wanted to run, to escape the nightmare the house had become, but their eyes held mine, a silent plea that rooted me to the spot. The fire roared, the house's timbers catching, the heat overwhelming. Then, just as suddenly, the fire died, the room plunged into darkness, the whispering stopped, leaving only the pounding of rain and my ragged breaths. The figures were gone, the letter reduced to ashes, but their plea echoed in my mind. Shaken, I fled the room, the house seeming to settle back into its usual groans and creaks. I knew I couldn't stay, but as I packed my belongings, a cold certainty settled in my heart. The story wasn't over. The voices, the fire, the apparitions, they were part of something larger, a wound in the fabric of this place that wouldn't heal with my departure. As I write this, the rain has finally stopped, but the silence is oppressive, heavier than the storm. Tonight, I'll leave Eldridge, but the story remains, tethered to the house, to the land. It's waiting, I realize, not just to be told, but to be understood, resolved. And deep down, I know it's only a matter of time before I return, drawn back to the whispers in the rain, to the ghosts that refuse to be forgotten. The road from Eldridge was a tunnel of blackness, the headlights of my car struggling to pierce the veil of night. Each mile added to the weight in my chest, a mix of relief and unresolved dread. The house, with all its secrets and whispers, was behind me, but the echoes of those trapped souls clung to me like a second skin. I stopped at a small motel some miles out of town, the neon sign flickering a ghostly welcome. Inside, the clerk was an elderly man, his eyes too sharp, too knowing. He handed me the key with a nod, his fingers brushing mine with a coldness that made me shiver. The room was nondescript, the wallpaper peeling slightly at the corners, the air stale. I dropped my bag and sat on the edge of the bed, the springs creaking ominously under my weight. As I turned off the light, the darkness settled around me, thick and suffocating. I lay back, closing my eyes, willing sleep to take me. But it was a restless sleep, filled with dreams of fire and shadowy figures. They stood around my bed, their eyes hollow, their mouths moving in silent screams. I woke with a start, the room cloaked in shadow, the only light the dull red glow of the digital clock, 3.07 a.m. The air felt charged, electric. My skin prickled with the sensation of being watched. I reached for the lamp, my hand shaking. The light flickered to life, casting eerie shadows against the walls. That's when I saw it, a figure in the corner, barely discernible but undeniably there. It was a child, a boy, his eyes hollow pits of darkness, his skin ashen. He stood perfectly still, watching me. His lips moved, a whisper carried across the room, you can see us. I froze, the words iced down my spine. What do you want? My voice was barely a whisper, choked with fear. Help us, he replied, his voice a wind chime in a grave wind. Who are you? I asked, though part of me didn't want to know. The forgotten, he said, and then he was gone, the shadows swallowing him whole. 
I didn't sleep again that night or the nights that followed. I traveled by day, stopping only when necessary, haunted by the apparition of the boy and the voices that seemed to follow me from Eldritch. As I drove, I pieced together the history of the house and its spectral inhabitants. Each town I passed through, I researched, digging through old newspapers and talking to locals who remembered the stories. Eldridge was a town with a past shrouded in tragedy, a fire that had claimed a family, a series of unexplained disappearances, a town that seemed to breed sorrow as others did crops. The deeper I dug, the more the pieces came together, a tapestry of grief and horror that spanned decades. And always, at the center, was the house, the heart of the darkness. I returned to Eldridge under a cloak of storm clouds, the sky a roiling tumult of gray and black. The town was eerily quiet, the streets deserted. As I drove past the old landmarks, the library, the grocery store, each seemed to watch me, windows like eyes, doors like mouths ready to swallow me whole. The house was just as I had left it, the porch light still flickering, a beacon in the growing dusk. I parked at the end of the driveway, my heart a drumbeat of dread in my chest. As I approached the front door, the wind picked up, the trees whispering secrets I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. Inside, the air was cold, colder than it should have been. The silence was oppressive, the only sound my own breathing and the distant rumble of thunder. I walked through the rooms, each step echoing in the empty spaces. In the living room, the fireplace was blackened, the memory of fire etched into the stone. I heard it then, a sound that made my blood run cold, the faint, pitiful sobbing of a child. It was coming from upstairs, from the attic. I swallowed my fear, my feet moving of their own accord. The stairs creaked under my weight, a morose melody to accompany the cries. At the top, the door to the attic was ajar, a sliver of darkness beckoning. I pushed it open, the hinges groaning. The room was filled with shadows, the boxes and furniture mere shapes in the dim light. The sobbing was louder now, a lamentation that filled the space. Hello? My voice sounded foreign in the gloom. The sobbing stopped abruptly, a silence falling like a curtain. Then, a voice, small and trembling, please, help us. The flashlight in my hand flickered, and in the brief moment of light, I saw them, children, half a dozen, their eyes wide and pleading, their forms semi-transparent. They were trapped, their souls tied to the house, to the tragedy that had claimed them. How can I help you? I asked, my voice steady despite the trembling in my limbs. Free us, a girl said, stepping forward, her hand reaching out, fingers brushing mine with a chill that seeped into my bones. I nodded, unsure but compelled. I'll try. As the storm outside crescendoed, the children told their stories, voices overlapping, a symphony of sorrow. And as they spoke, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place, a dark history written in pain and fear. But as they finished, the house began to shake, timbers groaning under an unseen force. The children's faces twisted in fear. Hurry, they urged, their voices desperate. I stood, determined to end their suffering, to unravel the knot of malevolence that held them here. As the house trembled, the walls seeming to close in, I felt the weight of their hope, their trust, heavy on my shoulders. The night was far from over, the storm outside mirroring the turmoil within. As the foundation of the old house trembled beneath the force of the storm, I found myself drawn deeper into its bowels, each room revealing layers of untold stories, each whisper a thread in the dark tapestry of its history. The air grew colder, the atmosphere charged with a palpable tension as if the very walls were braced for the revelations to come. The storm raged against the windows, a relentless assault 
but it was nothing compared to the chaos unfolding within the house. As I moved through the darkened hallways, the flashlight's beam cut through the blackness, revealing glimpses of the past, flickering images of the house's former inhabitants, their expressions twisted in fear or sorrow. In the kitchen, the old iron stove was cold, but it felt as if a residual heat lingered, a memory of fire and panic. The cupboards, when opened, emitted a gust of stale air, mixed with the scent of burnt wood and something far less identifiable, something sinister. The whispers grew louder, a cacophony of voices that seemed to echo from the very depths of the house. Save us, they pleaded, a chorus of despair. I followed the sound, drawn irresistibly towards the basement, the heart of the house, the source of its pain. The door to the basement was stiff, swollen with moisture, resisting my efforts. When it finally gave way, it opened with a mournful creak that sent shivers down my spine. The stairs descended into darkness, the air growing cooler with each step. The smell of earth and mold was overwhelming but beneath it was something else, something foul, a hint of decay. As I reached the bottom, the flashlight revealed an earthen floor, damp walls, and chains hanging from the ceiling, their purpose as ominous as the stains that marked them. In the far corner, a pile of belongings, a child's shoe, a woman's shawl, a doll with one eye missing, spoke of lives interrupted, of terror and flight. Then, the air shifted, and a chill enveloped me, so intense it felt as though the very marrow in my bones had frozen. I turned slowly, the flashlight's beam trembling in my hand. There, materializing from the shadows, was a figure. Tall, its features obscured by the darkness, its presence commanding yet utterly terrifying. Its eyes, when they met mine, burned with an unholy light, its gaze penetrating to the depths of my soul. You do not belong here, it hissed, the voice not just heard but felt, a vibration that rattled my teeth. I'm here to help, I replied, my voice steadier than I felt. To free them. They are mine, the figure growled, stepping closer, the temperature dropping with each step. I stood my ground, though every instinct screamed at me to flee. I will release them, I declared, though I did not fully understand how. The figure laughed, a sound like the crackling of fire. Try, it challenged, and then it was gone, dissipated like smoke in a breeze. But the threat lingered, a palpable darkness that clung to the air. Shaken, I turned back to the pile of belongings, each item a marker of a life stolen. I reached out, touching the doll, its remaining eye staring up at me, glassy and accusing. The whispers crescendoed, urgent now. Help us, they begged. I gathered the items, laying them out on the ground, a makeshift memorial. Then, closing my eyes, I spoke aloud offering words of release, of peace. The words felt right, though they came unbidden, flowing from some deep, unexplored part of myself. As I spoke, the air began to warm, the oppressive atmosphere lifting slightly. The chains rattled softly, as if in response, and the ground beneath my feet vibrated with a gentle, yet powerful energy. When I opened my eyes, the room was lighter, the shadows retreating. The belongings seemed just a little less sad, the dolls I less accusatory. It was working, I realized with a start. I was helping them. Encouraged, I continued, moving through the house, repeating the ritual in each room, each space that held a whisper of the past. And as I did, the house seemed to sigh in relief, the weight of its dark history lifting thread by thread. But the night was not over, and the storm outside had not abetted. The figure's threat echoed in my mind, a warning that there was more to be done, more to face. The whispers had changed now, not just pleading but encouraging, guiding me onward. 
I knew I needed to return to the attic, the place where it had all begun, where the shadows had first gathered and the voices had first spoken. As I ascended the stairs, the wind howled, a mournful dirge that seemed to mourn the passing of an age, the end of a story. The attic awaited, the door ajar as always, an invitation or a challenge. I stepped inside, the flashlight illuminating the room, the sheets over the furniture billowing slightly as if in breath. The air was thick with the power of unspoken things, of secrets held too long. Here, I would make my stand, here I would finish what I had begun. The shadows gathered, the whispers rose, and the house held its breath, waiting for the story to unfold, for the next chapter to be written in the ongoing saga of Eldridge. The rain continued to fall, a constant reminder that some tales are too deep, too dark to ever truly end. The attic felt like a realm not of this world, a place where time and space convulsed in a haunting dance. As I stepped across the threshold, the temperature plummeted, a bone-chilling cold that seemed to seep into every pore. The whispering intensified, a cacophony of voices that filled the space with desperation and sorrow. I walked among the sheets draped over furniture, their edges fluttering as if disturbed by some unseen presence. My flashlight flickered erratically, the beams cutting through the darkness only to be swallowed up by deeper shadows. The air was thick, almost palpable, as if I could reach out and touch the despair that hung in the air like a tangible thing. A sudden movement caught my eye, a shadow detaching itself from the darkness. I swung the beam of my flashlight towards it, heart hammering in my chest. The light revealed a woman, her features gaunt, eyes hollow with grief. She stared at me, her lips moving silently, and then, as if the wind carried her words, I heard her whisper, please, and our pain. I nodded, understanding flooding through me. This was why I had been drawn back to this place, why the house had not let me go. It was not just to uncover the truth, but to heal, to mend what had been broken. I stepped closer to her, my voice steady despite the fear that gnawed at my insides. I will do everything I can, I promised. She nodded, her form flickering like a candle flame in a draft. Turning away, I set about the task I knew I had to perform. From my bag, I retrieved a small, old book, an ancient tome of rituals and rites that I had found in the town's local library. Its pages were yellowed with age, the text written in a flowing, archaic script. I had studied the book for days, deciphering the rituals that I believed would cleanse the house and free the spirits trapped within. With a deep breath, I began to recite the words, the language strange and melodious. As I spoke, the atmosphere in the attic began to shift. The oppressive weight lifted gradually, like the slow receding of floodwaters. Shadows seemed to retreat, curling away from the edges of light cast by my flashlight. The ritual took what felt like hours, each word a strain, each sentence a battle against the darkness. But I persisted, driven by the desperate hope in the eyes of the apparition and the other spirits I had encountered. As I uttered the final word, a silence profound and complete descended upon the attic. The air shimmered, as if reality itself was bending, reshaping. Then, a light began to glow, soft and warm, spreading through the room. It touched each shadow, each corner, bathing the space in a gentle radiance. One by one, the spirits appeared, their forms gaining clarity and substance. They looked at me, and in their eyes, I saw gratitude, relief. The woman who had first spoken stepped forward, her expression one of peace. Thank you, she said, her voice clear now, no longer just a whisper carried by the wind. The light grew brighter, enveloping each spirit. One by one, they faded, their forms dissolving until nothing remained but the light. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, the light receded, 
pulling back like the tide, leaving the attic empty, the oppressive atmosphere gone, replaced by a sense of peace. Exhausted but elated, I sank to the floor, the book slipping from my hands. The battle was over, the spirits were freed. The house felt different now, lighter, as if it too could finally rest. Outside, the storm had abetted. The first light of dawn crept across the sky, painting the world in hues of gold and pink. I left the attic, my steps light, a smile touching my lips. As I walked through the house, I felt no fear, no whispers in the dark. It was just a house now, nothing more. I stepped outside, the morning air fresh against my skin. The sun rose fully above the horizon, its rays banishing the last of the night's shadows. I looked back at the house one last time, a sense of closure filling me. As I drove away from Eldridge, the house receding in my rearview mirror, I felt a chapter closing behind me. But in every end, there is a beginning, and I knew my journey was not over. There would be other places, other spirits in need of peace. The road stretched out before me, and I followed it, driven by a new purpose, a new understanding of the shadows and the light. And as Eldridge faded into the distance, the sun climbing higher in the sky, I felt a whisper of wind, as if saying farewell, or perhaps, until next time. The world was wide, filled with mysteries to explore and stories to tell, and I was ready to face whatever came next, armed with knowledge, courage, and a profound respect for the unseen world that threads through our own, always just out of sight, but never out of mind.